So I have a lot of stuff going on down here in the animal room right now, and one of those is that essentially I'm running out of space. Now it's no secret, it's been going on for a little while now, and I did a lot of cool stuff on this side of the room that will really help with that. There's also been a lot of bad stuff happening lately. I just have a streak right now. It tends to, I guess, always pile on itself. So I'll tell you about that as well. Let's get into it. So this right here is the area that I'm referring to. It looks pretty cool as it is now, but it's not set up nearly as optimally as it probably could be. What I did is I rebuilt this completely so that it can fit one, two, I wanna say five tanks on it. And I built it around everything that's going on it. So see that here shortly. And then with this one over here, you'll see that there's a gap in between the edge of this tank and then the edge of this. What I did is on the new one, it's the same starting there, but it goes all the way to this edge here. So it makes just like a perfect L that fits around the corner of the wall. What that does is allows us to come more so this way and fit more tanks, that sort of thing. Moving all of these tanks over is gonna be easier said than done. I'm actually gonna move all of these over to the new rack. I'm not dismantling any of them except for this one right here. This is the Ghost Shrimp Ghost Ship. I just can't seem to get it dialed in and I really never intended for it to be a long-term setup anyway. I'll take all the inhabitants, put them into a quarantine tank or into one of the other ones here and just dismantle it, salvage what I can and move on to something else. Another thing is with this paludarium right here. This is Mia the Betta's setup and she's actually not in there right now. I moved her over into the quarantine area because she's not feeling too well. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on in the video, but in the meantime, I'm gonna get this tank dismantled and we'll move forward. Nothing too crazy here. I netted up all the inhabitants, removed the plants and decorations, and drained the tank. As I did, I vacuumed out the substrate to make my job easier. All good over here, I've got the tank cleaned and moved out, which means we can move over to this area. You'll see that I've got the first rack moved in ready to go looking pretty good talk about how i built that later in the video but what i'm going to do is put it where this one is so i'll do my regular maintenance on these tanks drain them down pretty low and move out the fish put this rack where that one is put the tanks on it and fill them up put the fish back in it'll basically be equivalent to a 100 percent water change i followed the same process as before i drained some water rounded up the fish sucked out the rest and moved the tanks Alright, so it's the next day. I've got this rack set up, or while well, these two tanks leased, I gotta put a light on the one on top. And I've got the other rack moved in here and ready to go. So I'm gonna have to repeat the process on this side of the room. So give me a second to do that real quick and then we'll circle back. So here we are after all of that. It's looking incredible and I love how everything turned out. I apologize for not really filming much of the process though. It's a pretty stressful thing because of how many animals are involved with this. So I really just wanted to focus on what I was doing. Anyway, there's several reasons why I switched over to these new racks. Especially lately, I've really been just kind of battling with the lack of space that I have down here. And doing this allowed me to further optimize what I'm working with. The previous set of racks, although functional, were built around a different set of enclosures. As a result, there wasn't much room for deviation, but I did the best I could for a while. Moving over to these new ones allowed me to basically double the amount of real estate I have to work with. As you can see, I have all of the enclosures on here that I did previously and more, such as this 25 gallon tank, which I'm really excited to get moving on. Don't expect it anytime soon though. It's going to take quite a while to get it looking exactly how I want. For now, I've got my books and a few other miscellaneous items up here, but eventually I'm going to move all of this over to another area into the room and I'll have this entire top shelf to work with. I also don't think that the previous set of shelves look nearly as nice as these ones did. I put a lot of work in them to get them to look a certain way, and I think it paid off. On that, I'm sure that some of you are wondering how I even built a shelf like this to begin with. Now, it's a process that I've shown a few times before on the channel, but I'll briefly outline it again for those of you who've missed it. I start out by cutting 2x4s and 2x3s to various lengths. From there I attach boards together to create all of the shelves. I add brace boards to most of these for additional strength. From there I measure for the appropriate height of each shelf and lock them into upright posts. I put some half inch thick plywood on the top of these. To make the look even cleaner, I nailed small boards to the front of these to hide the plywood edge. You can see here that I set the shelf back slightly from the post, and I did that so that this board here is flush with the front. Anyway, after that I apply some wood putty along the seams and screw holes to clean up the look. I sanded them down until smooth and stained them to match everything else in the room. 
After I applied a few coats of polyurethane, I secured MDF panels to the back, and here we are now. I honestly can't get enough of how it looks, and even though these are larger than the previous set, they actually appear smaller in the room. I believe that's because of the MDF boards I put on the back. They hide the cords and other things like that, which help things appear more cohesive. I want to know what you think though. Let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are on the new rack, and what do you think that I should do up on this top shelf here? I have a couple ideas in mind, but I'll keep those to myself for now. One of those ideas pertains to the guppies down here in the low tech pond. I'm not really too sure where this fits into the room right now, so I think that might be something that I do, but I'm not totally sure. On that though, they're doing extremely well, and they just recently had babies not long ago. Anyway, another thing that I wanted to talk about is Mia the Betta. As I explained earlier in the video, she's currently in the hospital and quarantine area. Let me preface everything that I'm about to say. When things go wrong down here in the animal room, my first thought is not to go to the camera. I know that's a good opportunity for me to perform well on YouTube because negative things typically do, but in those moments, the last thing that I'm thinking about is making content. In my mind, I need to act immediately and do whatever I can to solve the issue. You have to understand that at the end of the day, these are my pets. I love them, so their well-being comes before content. I say all of this because I didn't film anything that I did to bring Mia back to health. Again, at the time, it was the last thing I was thinking about. Anyway, one night when I went to feed Mia, I noticed she was acting strange. She wasn't coming to the front to interact with me, as she typically would. She was hiding out in the back and seemed completely uninterested with food. When she eventually swam forward, I was able to get a proper look. She appeared very swollen and didn't have proper mobility. That said, it didn't appear to be a swim bladder issue because she was swimming in the proper upright position. So I did the first obvious thing and performed a water change. I usually start there because water changes often help solve a lot of issues. Fast forward the next day and things didn't improve at all. At that point, I knew I had to get her out of that tank and put her into a hospital tank. And this is one of those times when it's really beneficial to have a proper quarantine area or hospital area, so that way if something goes wrong, you could take the fish out and monitor them more closely. A visual inspection told me two things. She was certainly bloated and that her egg spot was very prominent. As I considered what could be wrong with her, I thought that she was either constipated or egg bound. Being egg bound is quite rare, but it can happen. Usually you can determine which scenario it is based on where the swelling is occurring. However, she was so swollen by this point that I couldn't make a distinction either way. Considering all of this, I went to the miracle medication, aquarium salt. Salt can solve so many aquarium issues and is relatively gentle on most livestock, so I felt that it was a good place to start. I would have done this in her tank to start, but it would have killed the plants. Anyway, I let the salt run its course and came back the next day to check on her. Unfortunately, things degraded further. Her scales began to lift up in what is usually referred to as pine coning. You can kind of see it in this clip here. Scales lifting up or pine coning, of course, signified that she had dropsy. This was not a good thing to discover, but there is sort of a silver lining with it. Because I knew exactly what was going on, I was able to treat accordingly from then on. Using salt already was a good call. I also keep a lot of medications on hand, one of which is Maricin 2. As you see on the label, it can be used to treat dropsy. So from there, I began dosing the tank accordingly based on the directions of the box and hoped for the best. About two days later, it started taking effect and things were looking up. The pine coning had ceased, the swelling started going down a little bit, she began passing white stole, and most importantly, she started acting like herself again. I was very hopeful and continued with treatment. I was also feeding her exclusively frozen Daphnia to help keep her digestive system moving. After a 5 day treatment cycle, she looked and acted completely normal. So I followed the directions on the box, did a water change, and quit treating the tank. I was excited because it appeared that we beat the problem. However, within the next 2 days she regressed. She started swelling up again and acting weird. I did a few water changes and added more salt, but neither helped the issue. I ended up running another cycle of Maricin and it immediately took effect. She was and has been acting normal ever since and here we are now. After two full treatments, she appears to be back to health. I'm so happy about it because this is an awesome fish. She has a huge personality and has become an integral part of the animal room. As I try to determine what caused the issue, I keep going through the variables and I honestly think that it comes back to my initial diagnosis. 
She was either constipated, egg bound, or some combination of the two, which then resulted in dropsy. I say this because as she passed stool during treatment, it appeared to always have white balls in it, which to me looked like eggs. Of course, I could be totally wrong about all of this, but to me, it seems like a possible scenario. I keep her tank clean and the parameters are favorable, so I don't think it had anything to do with that. I really wanted to talk about this though in case you ever have to deal with dropsy. Set up a proper hospital tank, add a little bit of salt if you want, and dose with something like Marisin too. As most of you know, some of my videos are sponsored by Fritz Aquatics. They send me whatever products I need and pay me to show them on the channel. So in this way, it's sort of like a paid promotion for me to show this, but they don't tell me what to say or when to say it or anything like that. I just use the products organically and they support the channel. The reason I say this is because I don't want it to come across as though I'm just paid to push some product on you. I only work with companies that I believe in and I've been using Fritz products long before they sponsored the channel. To conclude on that, this stuff works and Mia likely wouldn't be here today had I not used this. As if this stuff with Mia wasn't enough. There's been another issue going on for months now that I finally just diagnosed. Allow me to explain. Back in November, I set up the new Suriname Toad Aquarium. It was looking good and the toads were doing really well for many months. About two months ago though, I noticed that the toads were acting kind of strange. I didn't think much of it at first because I keep their tank clean and consistent and they occasionally go off of food for a few days. However, after about four days, I started to become concerned. Since then, I've been able to get them to eat on and off, but never as consistently as before. In addition to that, they didn't quite seem to act the same. The thing is that I've been noticing breeding activity from them for a while now, so I assumed that all of this was indicative of that. However, just the other day, I finally figured out what the issue was. I was feeding the tank like normal at night, and then I felt a stinging sensation on my finger. At first, I thought that it may have been due to acidity in the water, but I had a eureka moment. I know that if there's a stray electrical current in the water, it can be detected through cuts. I dipped my finger in every other tank in the room, and I could not replicate the sensation. When I came back to this tank though, I got it every single time. So to test my hypothesis, I went and unplugged all of the equipment and sure enough it stopped. At this point, I knew that there had to be some sort of issue with the equipment. I tested everything individually to determine what it was and it appeared to be the heater or thermostat. Just to be sure, I decided to replace both heaters and the thermostat. At first, I was pleased with my decision and it appeared to be fixed. However, soon enough, the issue popped up again. I must have misdiagnosed it before or it was a combination of things. I tested all of the components individually once more and I could not get stung. So I went on to try combinations. What it turned out to be was the combination of the return pump and the heaters. Seems kind of odd to me but then again the entire situation was weird. Luckily I had a spare pump on hand so I swapped that out as well and the thing's been fixed ever since. Obviously I don't know for sure since I switched so many things at this point, but I believe that the problem was actually the pump and I just misdiagnosed it initially. Long story short, and no pun intended, a piece of equipment was malfunctioning and causing issues with the tank. It's a really weird situation that I never could have imagined because I've never experienced anything like it before. Needless to say, when I have issues with tanks in the future, it's definitely something that I'm going to be mindful of, and I wanted to bring it to your attention because maybe some of you have had this issue before and didn't even know it. There is one more thing that I almost forgot to share. About two months back at a local fish store, I saw that they had more gold ring Danios, so I picked those up and they've been in quarantine ever since. I'll add them to this tank, but that's pretty much all I got for you in this one, Serpa Squad. Let me know what you think about everything down in the comments. What do you want to see next on the open area on that rack? And until next time, take care and peace.